Rosalie Gardner Jones was born on February 24th, 1883, to Dr. Oliver Jones and Mary Elizabeth Jones, who were both first cousins. Rosalie was one of six children. The Joneses were a prominent family from Long Island, descended from Thomas Jones, the man that Jones Beach is named after. The family rose further in wealth and status after joining with other similarly prominent families in the area. This expansion started around the time of the American Revolution when Rosalie's great-grandfather, John, married a daughter of the Hewitt family, which owned significant land and several mills in the Cold Spring Harbor area. Two of their sons, Walter and John H., further increased the family prestige and wealth when they made the shrewd business decision to shift from the wool industry to the whaling industry after the wool market crashed in the 1830s. These two would be the initiators and main driving force of the Cold Spring Harbor whaling industry from the time it began until its eventual end on the eve of the Civil War, shortly following both their deaths. One of their brothers, Charles, would further increase the family's holdings when he married a daughter of the Gardner family. The descendants of Lion Gardner, who was a British military engineer, veteran of the Pequot War, and the original European landowner of what became known as Gardner's Island in the 1600s. The Gardner family also eventually acquired large parts of Eaton's Neck, which Rosalie eventually inherited. But little is known of Rosalie's childhood did not foreshadow any of the rebellious or maverick behavior that she would later be known for. Before becoming a suffragist, she was educated, socialized, and lived the life expected of someone of her status. Indeed, it appears as though no one in the family actually worked, but instead, in the words of a later descendant, sat and looked at poverty. Of course, money does not equate happiness or stability, and Rosalie's oldest sibling, Oliver Jr., suffered from mental illness and either directly or indirectly caused the destruction of the large Jones Manor House. Depending on the source, he either burned it down himself or was in a sanitarium at the time. If the latter, it is said that his distraught father, Oliver Sr., wandered off one night in reaction to his son's condition, prompting another son to put an oil lamp in the house's cupola as a beacon, which in turn caught fire and burned down the massive manor house. No matter what the truth is, the end results were the same. The house was bur burned to the ground, Oliver Jr. in a sanitarium, Oliver Sr. was heartbroken over his inability to help his mentally ill son. How this affected the 26-year-old Rosalie is not certain, but it was possibly the catalyst for a trip to England shortly following the event. Similarly, when Rosalie began her association with the suffrage movement, it's unclear. Though there are three likely candidates in, in this uh, regard. First, she might have been influenced by the active British suffrage movement during her trip to England, like many women at that time. Second, she may have been enlisted by NAWSAs during its society plan, which peaked around then, and saw New York area socialites like Alva Vanderbilt and Catherine Dewar McKay join. A third possibility is that Rosalie might have been pushing back against her mother, who was an outspoken anti and could perhaps accurately be described as overbearing, as will be seen. At any rate, Rosalie is recorded as taking part in her first outdoor suffrage demonstration while in New York City in 1911. The first public speech for suffrage took place at the bottom of the Roslyn clock tower to a gathering of three people and a dog. Despite this inauspicious start, Rosalie soon embarked on a tour of Long Island in May 1912 with fellow suffragist Elizabeth Freeman. The two rode around Suffolk and Nassau in a yellowed wagon drawn by a horse which was noted by many as being an excellent mascot. Whether this view was due to the horse being named Suffragette or because it was a nag was not specified. Horrible attempt at a joke aside, Rosalie and Elizabeth sold tea, cake, buttons, and suffrage literature to all those who would listen in order to fundraise for the suffrage movement in Ohio, as this was still before NAWSA's shift towards national instead of state-by-state -state suffrage. According to the Long, Island, Long Islander newspaper, the pair toured Suffolk via Shoreham, Port Jefferson, Smithtown, and Northport before heading to Nassau via Freeport and Garden City, finally returning to Rosalie's home in Cold Spring Harbor. They also spoke on Huntington's Main Street to a group of 200, respectively more than her attempt in Roslyn. It would be appropriate now to take a moment and look at the life of Elizabeth Freeman, Rosalie's closest associate. 
Rosalie and Elizabeth would form a symbiotic partnership in the same manner as Elizabeth Stanton and Susan B. Anthony or Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. In their case, Rosalie did most of the logistics and organizing while Elizabeth did most of the public speaking. Elizabeth was born in England, but raised in America with her two siblings by her mother, who had left their estranged father behind. The family arrived in New York and lived at the St. John Lynn Orphanage in the Northern Kings Park near Sunken Meadow. Though called an orphanage, the institution helped not just poor and needy children, but adults as well. The goal there was to give them all a chance at a better life that their means would otherwise have allowed. Elizabeth's mother, Mary, was given work at St. John Lynn and the children an education. In 1905, the family apparently returned to England, and at least Elizabeth and her mother made a living by selling silk flowers to nobility. It was at this time that Elizabeth came into contact with the suffrage movement. While riding a bus, Elizabeth witnessed a young suffragist being assaulted by a police officer. Without even knowing what the conflict was about, Elizabeth jumped off the bus and ran over to help, resulting in both being taken to jail. This dramatic introduction and her subsequent recruitment into the suffrage movement in England would see her jailed and beaten numerous times. Eventually, Elizabeth returned home to the United States and took part in the suffrage movement there. Whether she met Ro Rosalie at this point or previously in England is not certain. Their association spanned between 1912 tour of Long Island and the end of Rosalie's active association with the suffrage movement in roughly 1915. Elizabeth was not independently wealthy like Rosalie, so in 1916, she took a job with the Texas Woman Suffrage Association. Her trip through the South and subsequent time in Texas were ultimately a shock as the poverty and racism were at levels previously unknown to her. During her trip to Texas, she had a chance meeting with the NAACP's secretary, Roy Nash. Nash would later ask Elizabeth to help in uncovering the details surrounding the lynching of a young African-American in Waco, Texas, as Nash believed she could successfully pose as an investigator on a fact-finding mission. Her amicable association with the NAACP didn't end with her investigation, but included leading two subsequent national tours with them for an anti-lynching campaign. Elizabeth's treatment of African-Americans was one of the three major ways she was in contrast to Rosalie, whose record in that regard proved less than immaculate. Elizabeth was also in contrast regards to her financial situation, and finally, her continued participation in the suffrage movement to its completion. Elizabeth eventually joined the year-long White House protest of 1917 before the passing of the 19th Amendment. Following this, Elizabeth spent the rest of her life championing uh, causes for the needy, disabled, and blind until her death in 1942. Returning to 1912, the year would see Rosalie made president of the Nassau County branch of the NAWSA and go on to serve in that capacity for 1913 as well. These two years would also see her peak activity in the suffrage movement. Shortly after the May 1912 tour of Long Island, Rosalie and Elizabeth were also asked to tour Ohio to directly support the suffrage movement there. In Rosalie's own word regarding the choice of transport, we could have driven an automobile, but then we wouldn't have to stop so often. Whereas normally that would be a benefit in this situation, it would have caused them to miss opportunities to talk with the farmers, shopkeepers, and so on. Rosalie also made the assumption that they wouldn't need to spend much money in the way of provisions, as some of the locals would invariably be kind enough to feed them. Despite having some success in Ohio, being met politely or at least indifferently, Rosalie described the Ohio farmers as sour, colossal tightwads, who would let neither suffragist nor horse rest on their property without a cash advance and presumably fail to provide the expected free meals. Following her return from Ohio, Rosalie would subsequently undertake her more notable actions in the suffrage movement. Taking inspiration from the British movement, such as the Mud March of 1907, Rosalie shrewdly organized a highly publicized march, or pilgrimage in her own words, to Albany in order to convince or shame the new governor, William Saltzer, into supporting a proposition for suffrage in New York and gain as much public attention as possible for suffrage as a whole. In the process, Rosalie gained the nickname of General for marching at the head of her army, as it were. Despite being called ridiculous by Rosalie's anti-mother, the marches proved quite successful from a publicity perspective. The first march commenced on December 16, 1912, and went from the Bronx, proceeding 140 miles north to Albany over an 11-day period. 
With the exception of a small dedicated core of five, including Elizabeth Freeman and the ever effervescent Ida Kraft, known as the Colonel, and seen here second from the right next to Rosalie, most of the marchers would attach themselves to the pilgrimage for span before returning home and being replaced by another group. The group wore black, excuse me, brown cloaks and carried yellow knapsacks, staffs, and banners while trekking through the fog, rain, mud, and snow of a December in upstate New York. Along the way, they distributed leaflets and spoke outdoors. Rosalie's mother proved it to be an impediment to her daughter during the trip, either through overprotectiveness or in it, the guise of it. According to the New York Times on December 21st at Wappinger Falls, quote, the hike came near ending here, so far as General Jones was concerned. Mrs. O.L. Jones, stay-at-home mother of the marching general, had heard in New York that her daughter was suffering from foot soreness and was in danger of breaking down. She at once dispatched a trained nurse to stop the army whenever he found it and ordered General Jones home, end quote. The nurse apparently did catch up with Rosalie, still at Wappinger Falls, but was sent back to Rosalie's mother with the message that she intended to make it to Albany. However, this does not appear to be the end of the matter, as the New York Times reported Mrs. Oliver Jones intended to take a high-powered car to overtake the marchers between Poughkeepsie and Rhinebeck in order to personally persuade Rosalie to return home. Whether this second attempt came to pass or not is unrecorded, but either way, Rosalie and her corps continued on. The second pilgrimage, excuse me, arriving in Albany on December 28th, the small group had their ranks bolstered by the local suffragists on their final lay to the state capitol building. Nevertheless, it was three days before the governor received them on December 31st, and in turn, he promised his support, stating that he had already advised the legislators to pass a measure regarding suffrage. Although this measure eventually failed to pass, the march was immediately successful in pressuring Sulzer to make an attempt, and in particular for accumulating media attention. The second pilgrimage was only a few months later and a prelude to the large national gathering in Washington, D.C. called the Women's Suffrage Procession that Alice Paul had organized. Rosalie was to lead the New York section and marched from Newark, New Jersey to, to D.C. This march was roughly 100 miles longer than a previous one to Albany, clocking in at 245 miles over 16 days. Once again, most marchers attached themselves for a while before returning home, but roughly a dozen made up its dedicated core. As seen in this picture, they were from left to right and from back to front. Hetty Graham, Marie Berga, May Morgan, Olive Schultz, Evelyn, excuse me, Evelyn McCullough, Elizabeth Freeman in the front left, Ida Kraft, Mary Bolt, Rosalie Jones, Martha Klatchkin, and Mary Baird. Although this photo up focused on the women, there were several men who had also marched with the group. Among the men was Mil Milton Wend, who was a college in college at the time and at over six feet quite recognizable in this and other images of the marches. He is seen here looking backwards with a bugle under his arm next to Rosalie and behind the scout car driven by Olive Schultz. Elizabeth Freeman was tasked with guiding the supply wagon as the group made their way to Washington, D.C. On this slide, the path they followed from Newark, New Jersey to Washington, D.C. is listed. Sources record that the original intent was to march from New York City itself, but permission was not granted to use the crossings. So the group instead started at Newark. Note that these two images on the slide were taken in the same location and time, judging from the, both the clothing worn by the participants and the buildings behind the marchers. Also note that while the left photograph includes everyone, the one on the right has the male marchers out of view, an example of how photographs aren't always absolutely accurate about what historically occurred, particularly if they are posed for the media. At any rate, Although the march was predominantly successful, it was somewhat marred by an incident as it made its way through Maryland. At Laurel, roughly halfway between Baltimore and DC, a group of African-American suffragists wanted to join Rosalie's procession, but were turned away by her. Afterwards, Rosalie said two Southern men threatened the group and claimed that, quote, 
if you advocate votes for Negro women, you will indeed find that your way to Washington lies through the enemy's country, end quote. In response, Rosalie is alleged to have said, the men and women of these states must solve their own problems. Other groups have faced similar dilemmas leading up to and during the subsequent march through Washington, D.C., varyingly acted either in the same manner or defied the threats and welcomed the African-American marchers into their ranks. There appears to have been no NAWSA policy on the matter, but instead left to the individual qualities of each group's leader. Opinion, opinions over the best action to take vary in the group, with Kraft in particular being against them joining, but ultimately all responsibility rests on the shoulders of a leader. Unfortunately, Rosalie seems to have fallen short and the responsibility, re and the responsibility rests on the, her shoulders alone. Um, however, Rosalie did not speak, excuse me, apologize. However, Rosalie did speak up for her male compatriots when a message from Alice Paul shortly before the controversy at Laurel st stated that the men and those who did not march the whole distance were not to march with Rosalie in New York possession in Washington, D.C. Rosalie refused to march in those if those, like Milton Wentz, Elizabeth Freeman, and Olive Schultz, the latter two of who were steering the horse cart and the scout car, respectively, could not march as well. It can be seen from this that Rosalie, in other situations, proved her mettle as a good leader. At any rate, the procession made it to the Capitol on February 28th to, to much press coverage and with a large crowd greeting and cheering them, amongst whom it was said was Rosalie's own mother, despite her descent to the suffrage movement and previous antics during the Albany March. In this image, Rosalie is leading the New York marchers through Washington, DC. The woman suffrage procession that they were a part of was not without incident, as noted in part one. This picture seems to be taken during one of the calmer moments. One may you know the mounted sentry at right and the good Samaritans, both young and old, who appear to be flanking the marchers in order to act as a barrier from troublemakers. The New York hikers, as they were referred to here in this display, are indicated with a red arrow. They were located in the middle of the procession. The diagram was unfortunately too tall for a single screen. So the left-hand one is the front of the parade from Inez Milholland at the bottom on her horse and the, to the French at top and the right-hand image picking up where that left off at its bottom and proceeding so on to the top. The New York section central location ultimately would spare them from the brunt of any trouble. Following the women suffrage uh, procession, Rosalie would once again make headlines when she earned the rather courageous distinction of being the first American suffragist to fly in an, Amer in an airplane and distribute flyers. This great feat occurred on May 20th, 1913, when Rosalie and her pilot, Harriet Bingham Brown, seen here at left with a couple of different passengers, flew over Staten Island in an early right aircraft of the type seen in the images at right. The New York Times reported that, quote, General Rosalie did not show a sign of fear as she took her seat in the biplane, seized a steel rod, the only thing to hold to, with her left hand, had her skirts tied down with a little piece of blue string and with a bunch of leaflets in her right hand, nodded a smiling goodbye to the crowd below. End quote. Adorned with votes for women banners, the plane arrived at the flying carnival of the Staten Island Aeronautical Society, roughly two miles away on Staten Island's eastern shore in a shower of yellow leaflets. It is surprising that Rosalie was unable to unleash the, the pamphlets on her flight without the propellers behind her turning all of them to confetti. The flight took 15 minutes, which was a leisurely pace even for aircraft of that period. This daring achievement was followed later in the year with an automobile tour of upstate New York in a yellow suffrage car, perhaps having had enough of horses from the previous year's tours of Long Island and Ohio. It was at about this time that Rosalie's family suffered its second tragedy in August 1913. Oliver Sr., still distraught over his son's suffering and his personal inability to help him, committed suicide in their New York City residence. 
Mrs. Jones and one of her other daughters, Louise, were in the house at the time and understandably shaken. The family claimed that it was an accident while he was trying to clean his pistol. It's not supported by the police or the fact that he shot himself in front of a bathroom mirror. An odd place to clean a firearm considering water isn't used for. Compounding the tragedy, Oliver Sr. did not die immediately, but was taken to hospital unconscious before dying the following day. On January 1st, 1914, Rosalie once again marching on, on Albany, but nearly twice the pace as last time, taking six days instead of 12 days, the 1913 suffrage hike required. Many familiar faces from her previous marches attended this one, like Ida Kraft and Melton Wendt. Despite being only a year later, the suffragists met with a new governor as the previous one, Sulzer, had been impeached and removed from office after only nine months when he ran afoul of Tammany Hall. Unfortunately, the new governor, Glynn, did not voice an interest in actively supporting the movement like Sulzer had, causing an impasse. But Rosalie stated that although they didn't want to hike again, we shall march next year, however, and every year thereafter until women are granted suffrage. Despite her statement, at this time, it seems that Rosalie parted the movement as an active participant. Although not specifically documented anywhere, it is possible that this, stage, this change occurred in the wake of a string of state suffrage amendments being defeated in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania in 1915. That same year, she is quoted as saying, quote, I think my words will resonate in coming years, even after suffrage has been achieved, as I know it will be. When will women think for themselves and burn the bridges of conventionalities behind them and dare to do the thing they actually desire to do? When will they heave off this hypocritical devotion to convention and be themselves, end quote. For Rosalie, it appears her desire was now to briefly study to be an auto mechanic and a saleswoman. Following this, she focused increasingly on her education, graduating from Adelphi College and the Brooklyn Law School before heading to Washington, D.C. and receiving degrees from Washington College of Law and George Washington University in 1919, and ultimately receiving a Doctor of Civil Law degree in 1922. In the middle of her focus on education, Rosalie's family suffered two more losses. The first loss being her troubled brother, Oliver Jr.'s death to pneumonia in March 1918, and the second being the death of her mother in October that same year during the influenza epidemic. Rosalie's efforts at higher education also occurred during America's participation in World War I, but more relevantly, during the final push for women's suffrage with the previously mentioned White House picketers and the depredations they had to endure. Even though she may have been in Washington, D.C. for her education at the time of the picketing, there's no record that Rosalie participated in any suffrage acts after her 1914 march to Albany, or at the very latest following her 1915 remarks regarding the certain eventual success of suffrage. Following the 19th Amendment's ratification, Rosalie participated in the peace movement, tried to have Robert Moses removed from power, wrote a couple books, and eventually married Senator Clarence Dill in 1927 at the St. John's Church in Cold Spring Harbor. True to her personality, it's perhaps not surprising that Rosalie insisted that the traditional word of obey be removed from the ceremonial vows. Unfortunately, it seems that the marriage was not successful, ending in 1936 with with Senator Dill describing Rosalie as being a terrible wife, housekeeper, and for burying garbage and dogs in the backyard, as well as constantly embarrassing him. In fairness, it seems more surprising that Senator Dill expected to domesticate her. Following the marriage, Rosalie changed her, back, her name back to Jones, moved to Laurel Hollow, and had an unsuccessful bid for a seat in Congress in 1936. During her final years, Rosalie would, could be called a town eccentric. It appears that she was not a particularly pleasant person, though few people who affect change in history ever are. There are numerous accounts of legal run-ins with neighbors and various spiteful actions on her part. There at least one famous example is more a legend than fact. Perhaps due to her law degrees and wealth, she had a tendency to bring many arguably frivolous disagreements to court to the point where some locals began to refer to such cases as Rosalie's. Two of these cases involved her well-known herd of goats, 
which had once made local news when one of them hung itself when it jumped out of a window, despite being tethered by its neck to a second goat, which wished to remain inside and alive for that matter. This event prompted a newspaper to write an article titled, Rosalie's Goat Commits Suicide. Another case involving her goats was against the railroad when during a critical fuel crisis amid World War II, a railway car containing 150 of her goats on its journey back north from southern winter pastures was placed on a siding in preference for cars carrying vital oil. Rosalie informed the authorities using the Interstate Commerce Act that all of her goats would need to be milked by the railroad each day that they were delayed, resulting in the goats arriving in Cold Spring Harbor the following day. Another occurrence of her goats causing legal issues was when some of the herd ate a neighbor's dahlia crop. Rosalie was accused of violating the village's ordinances by using her property as a commercial nursery, but Rosalie defended herself using English common law and its stipulation that it is a responsibility of a property owner to use fences to keep livestock out of their lands and not of a livestock owner to use fences to keep them in their lands. Rosalie used English common law as a defense once more against the residents of Eaton's Neck when they brought a suit against her for allowing people with low income to build beach houses on her beach and collecting rent from them. It was also in regards to these houses or shacks that Rosalie once more acted in a racist manner, namely by refusing to rent to any black family. The case over the shacks dragged on before the community support split for it or it split and faltered, eventually hand, handing her victory. The shacks weren't Rosalie's only business venture on Eaton's neck to cause problems, having also angered her neighbors by installing a gate near today's firehouse and charging at 1920s rates. One dollar to park for a day and a further 50 cents to spend the night on her beach property. However, Rosalie wasn't always successful at court. For example, she was prevented from having her Eaton's neck and Ashbroken holdings of 186 acres turned into a sand and gravel pit. She also had her suit to get the Causeway Road declared a public road in an attempt to develop the wetlands of Ashbrook and both fail. In the wake of these defeats, Rosalie showed her petty side by having a hot dog stand built to harass the families that won the suit. She was also once legally compelled to dispose of the decaying corpse of a horse she owned after she had failed to do so in a timely manner. She resolved the issue spitefully and perhaps hilariously by stuffing the corpse down the water well of the complainants. Sadly, it was not just her neighbors that Rosalie had a troubled relationship with, but her family as well. She had a long drawn out court battle with a sibling that she accused of mismanaging the family estates. Rosalie, perhaps unwisely, appears to have been given managerial control of the family's, family's Suffolk properties after this case, but failed to distribute her shares of the money she collected from rent to the other family members, as she was supposed to. She also is said to have sold the Eaton's Neck property, despite her mother's trust specifically restricting its sale until after a specific sibling's death. Whatever the truth of these stories, Rosalie obviously did not have an easy relationship with her family. Should also be said that logic dictates that when a person has numerous and chronic conflicts with their neighbors and their family, the common denominator as to why this is the case is that person themselves. The final story of note involving Rosalie is her alleged link to the existence, existence of the infamous oil storage tanks in Cold Spring Harbor. Anyone familiar with Cold Spring Harbor between 1927 and 2005 is similarly familiar with the eyesore that the tanks created on an otherwise idyllic shoreline. There are many versions of how of a story about how their existence is a result of Rosalie's spite against the neighborhood, neighboring Cold Spring Harbor Beach Club for not inviting her to join while the rest of her family was. The object of her wrath was Walter Jennings, who was the founder of the Beach Club, vice president of Standard Oil, and lived on a hill overlooking the harbor. Rosalie is said to have purchased some land next to the club from a struggling shipyard owner, owner named Walter Abrams, and then sold it to Jennings's ex-partner and current competitor, Herbert Lee Pratt Sr., who in turn erected the tanks to annoy Jennings for the six remaining years of Jennings's life. Despite it being a good story, story and admittedly funny, it's unfortunately not true. Deed documentation has shown that the land was sold directly from Abrams to Pratt without the involvement and colorful motivation of Rosalie. 
Nevertheless, the story does show the sort of behavior it deems believable when attributed to Rosalie. There's also always the possibility that she had an indirect or advisory role in Abrams selling the Pratt, but there's no finite evidence of the support to support this. Following World War II, not much is heard from or documented about Rosalie. She lived out the remainder of her days, apparently alone with her goats, finally passing away at the advanced age of 94 on January 12, 1978. Her ashes were subsequently scattered near her mother's tomb at St. John's Church in Cold Spring Harbor. Whether this was Rosalie's own wishes or a last laugh by her surviving family is unclear. Rosalie's life in many ways mirrored the women's suffrage movement as a whole. They were both long lasting, periodically combative, and not as spotlessly positive as history typically depicts them. On the negative side, her participation in the movement spanned from 1910 at the earliest until about 1915. Put bluntly, it was an exceedingly short period of time when Rosalie actively participated in the suffrage movement, which it must be noted, she left as an active participant before its completion. Rosalie also never placed, was placed in jail nor suffered any ill treatment by the police, something that many others endured, including her close associate, Elizabeth Freeman. It is also important to come to terms with the record of Rosalie's behavior towards African-Americans. The two documented interactions she had were both negative, having turned away African-American suffragists during her march to Washington, D.C., and not allowing African-Americans to rent any shacks on her Eaton's Neck Beach in later years. Considering her flaws, some might find it unjust that Rosalie is to have a statue installed in her honor at Cold Spring Harbor. However, it could be argued to be more unjust to wipe a person's name from reverence in response to several or even a solitary character flaw in a life otherwise defined by good deeds or social benefit. Isn't it more fair to view our predecessors as human beings capable of making mistakes and have such dwellers of a different time in turn be compared to the societal norms of their own respective eras as opposed to our own? Similarly, it would be, seem unfair if we now were to be judged by the future, future's unknowable societal norms of our great-grandchildren and subsequent generations. It would be a terrible thing for our own legacies to be forgotten or derided because we had once indulged in a hamburger or drove a fuel-powered vehicle. Rosalie herself, when assessed in the context of her time period, is indeed an extraordinary individual worthy of a statue. She was determined understood the need for public attention in achieving success of a social cause and prominently participated in one of the suffrage movement's critical phases. However, if Rosalie did not march alone, it does not seem fair that she sh should be honored alone. Perhaps it would be more equitable in her, if her statue were to also honor Elizabeth Freeman, Ida Kraft, and the numerous other lesser known female and male suffragists that repeatedly marched on Albany in Washington, D.C. for the cause of a woman's right to vote. For further reading on Rosalie Gardner-Jones, either of these two titles by Zachary Michael Jack are recommended, particularly in regards to the New York to Washington pilgrimage. The author takes a closer look at these sometimes conflicting personalities and views amongst the marchers that the time could not afford during this presentation. For further reading on the suffrage movement of Long Island, please consult Antonia Petrash's book on the topic. Thank you for your time and interest. Take care.